Hi everyone, this is Maura Sweeney and welcome to episode 24 in the ABCs of Now series. I must admit that this is going to take me some stepping out of my own comfort zone to deliver this episode uh, for a variety of reasons, some of which you'll easily detect as you listen along. I am going to talk today about the letter C. And C, as it turns out, is for crisis. For those of you who've been following along, you'll remember that episode 23 was D is for destruction. And although I did not like that word, uh, we came to find out that as we were going through the idea of empires through time uh, that rise and fall, the word destruction actually comes only to mean unbuilding. My next to last, or my most recent podcast, came to me not too long thereafter, and uh, to my surprise, it had no letter attached to it, which really disturbed me. I ended up calling it episode 23B. I called it Your Influence in the Now, and it was all about removing your energy, attention, agreement, and assent from people and ideas, behaviors and things that drain your life force. And conversely, applying your energy and attention to ideas, people, etc. that infuse you and add to your life force. So let me go back just for a moment, uh, as I normally do. The purpose of this ABCs of Now series has been to prepare and equip each one of us myself included, as we're navigating globally through one age, or we could call it one era or epic, and then entering into another. When I originally started this series, I thought it would maybe take six months, and here we are maybe one and a half, two years into this, uh, and we're still eking our way down to the end. Um, Through change, especially seismic type change, and what we're all learning day by day is that it can be unsettling because it reminds us of our own vulnerability. But this series is entirely intended to do the opposite. It's to find the bedrock of truth within us and anchoring for the soul where we can go through a sea of uncertainty and still be at rest and at peace. A few more words of introduction and explanation for today's podcast. This series is unwinding, unzipping, undoing, even unwrapping several ideas and concepts to which we've adhered ourselves over time. We're essentially viewing and examining these words and concepts to see which are true for us, which are partially or even fully false. We're giving ourselves time for personal reflection in order to make choices to discard what is old and false or low and those kinds of things that cannot stand up through the storm and what things are worth holding on to as enduring. Finally, I want to give you a vision if you want to get a picture of what's going on in this ABCs of now as we're going through the alphabet in reverse. I want you to think of this as a time when you can remove old clothing that you once wore, but what you're finding no longer applies to you. Okay, Um, what I'm going to be doing or what you can expect in this episode 24, C is for Crisis, is this. Um, We're going to give a definition of the word crisis along with its synonyms and antonyms. Next, I'm going to tell you what I originally thought this podcast would focus in on, but then I'm going to tell you a single but rather lengthy personal story that came flooding back from my life about a different type of a crisis. In many ways, I thought, oh, this feels very untimely, very uncomfortable, but I couldn't get away from it. Um, We're going to talk about the outcome or awareness of my personal story and how it applies to all of us in a universal fashion. And then I'm going to share the contents, quite briefly, of a a dream that I had years ago. And it was perhaps an early illustration 
of things that I would come to learn about our world. And I'm going to finish it off of, with all things, uh, with the definition of the word apocalypse. Now, I know that sounds like great fun, but stick with me because I encourage you that as you do, you'll find yourself coming in on a story. I have a friend who has once said, stories have the ability to take us from one reality to the next. And though my story may not be your story, I would hope that the outcome would be one that would make you feel more comforted, hopeful, and reassured, perhaps in ways you hadn't expected when you got started. So to begin, crisis. I came up with three definitions out of the American Heritage Dictionary and a fourth, rather, from dictionary.com. Here are some of those definitions. Crisis, a crucial or decisive point or situation, especially a difficult or unstable situation involving impending change. Number two, crisis is a sudden change in the course of a disease or fever toward either improvement, in which they put in brackets the word life, or deterioration, and in brackets the word death. Number three, American Heritage describes crisis as an emotionally stressful event or traumatic change in a person's life. And finally, I'll give you the dictionary.com definition. It's the point in a play or a story at which hostile elements are most tensely opposed to each other. It's also known as the boiling point. When I went into thesaurus.com, I wanted to find out some synonyms for crisis. And here are some of them. Catastrophe, change, confrontation, crunch, dilemma, disaster, emergency, pressure, situation, trouble, embarrassment, entanglement, pickle, dire straits. And for whatever reason, I wanted to underline these last three. Hour of decision, moment of truth, and lastly, turning point. So these are all some of the words that go along with this idea of a crisis. And I'm going to give you antonyms. The antonyms, you'll find, feel a lot better. Uh, They include agreement, benefit, blessing, breakthrough, Calm, good fortune, good luck, happiness, miracle, peace, solution, success, wonder, advantage, boon, and certainty. So my thought was that with crisis, we come face to face with knowing something we didn't see or know about before something unknown, unseen, and unheard of becomes evident and undeniable. We're forced to choose, to decide, to show ourselves for who we are until we end up on the other side, at which point we end up among those good feeling antonyms. So let's start with the story. When I first started getting the word C is for crisis, I remember being in the shower thinking, oh, I I don't like this word. In the same way, I didn't like the word um, D is for destruction. But I remember originally, and this was a while back, I was getting images of two crises. One was 9-11 and the other one was Hurricane Katrina from New Orleans. But surprisingly, my mind flowed to these events not in ways that I expected, not the outward catastrophes. Instead, in the case of 9-11, my focus went to these everyday heroes, people whose names and faces maybe we just didn't know, but they had arose seemingly out of nowhere in New York City to help their fellow man. My mind was brought back to people who came off the street to rescue, serve, and support perfect strangers in need. These were great acts 
in the midst of tragedy, and they spoke volumes of the goodness to be found and displayed among, among ordinary humans and four other humans. And then right behind that was Hurricane Katrina. As my mind looked toward Hurricane Katrina, which caused epic flooding in New Orleans, I could see return to my, to my mind's eye images of citizens rescuing people and even their pets off rooftops as they were being flooded out of their homes. People came by boats, others came by helicopters, and they were showing great acts of courage, kindness, and generosity to come to the aid of seeming strangers. So even during an era when some were decrying racism in America, I was seeing the opposite. People were helping everyone else and seeing them as brothers and sisters. I was even reminded uh, at that point of my then very young nephew from New Jersey, who along with several of his friends collected emergency provisions and sent pallets down to Louisiana to help these same hurricane victims. So that was kind of where it all started and then I got nothing and weeks went by and I got nothing. And then I got something else and I didn't like what I got. When you realize how the timing of this podcast and things that have been going on in the news, you'll probably even understand at some level why I didn't like it. Because this crisis appears to be all about uh, abortion, abortion. So I was, you know, I don't want to say taking my sweet time. I always wait for things to germinate for this. And when nothing happened, I suddenly realized that this crisis that I was going to be dealing with in my next podcast really was not going to focus so much on physical crises we're familiar with, but crises of another order. I was going to focus on crises of the unseen, crises that affect our mind, our emotions, our psyche, and our soul. And it is with that that I will share this with you. Um, and you could probably tell I have some notes that I took down. Um, hmm. Okay, here we go. In about the mid-1990s, I became involved with an organization called Concerned Women for America. Um, the state chair for this national organization was uh, had attended our church, and periodically she'd report on national legislative issues that were affecting families. Um, and I was very intrigued by this organization. I don't even want to say so much the organization, but let's say the access to information, things that were going on in our nation's capital. When I asked her one day if I could get some more information and possibly do some research on a topic of interest, I don't even remember what the topic was, I was surprised to find that she asked me to serve as the Florida State Communications Coordinator. I didn't know there was such a thing, but I ended up saying yes. And saying yes to this volunteer position proved both instructive and broadening in a variety of ways. As a mostly stay-at-home mom for a time, uh, and this probably went on for about two years, I wasn't full-time by any means, but I had the time to invest in this, I could research topics, write press releases, um, I could submit letters to editors of newspapers. I periodically interviewed on radio and TV uh, regarding Concerned Women for America's pro-family points of view here in Florida. It was, a, as I said, a very broadening experience. And for those of you who had never heard of Concerned Women for America or CWA, it was originally established in 1979 as a counterpoint or counter voice to now the National Organization of Women, uh, which at the time was lobbying for women's rights and the then um, very, I guess it was probably quite known, the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, CWA was several times the membership of NOW, but I guess most people wouldn't have known it because NOW was more of an activist uh, type organization in its approach. You'd see it with you know outdoor protests and placards, etc., where CWA would normally focus on things like 
prayer for the nation, uh, petitioning elected officials through various letters and phone calls, as well as educating family, neighbors, friends about upcoming or pending federal or state legislation that would affect families. And it was, you know, a national magazine that would come out every week, every month rather. So this was basically what was going on. We had the pro-choice, we had the pro-lifers, and here I was speaking uh, in the state of Florida as the uh, communications coordinator on the pro-life side. Now, oddly for me, I best recall identifying with CWA because they focused on the dangers of this proposed equal rights amendment to the Constitution. For National Organization of Women, that actually translated to things like equal pay in the workplace that would be on par with male counterparts. A very good thing and nothing to be criticized. And yet CWA, Concerned Women for America, had framed the, that same amendment as eventually having the possibility of women being constricted or drafted into the military. And I know that that was something that I certainly didn't want to see for myself, knowing full well what it was like when young men uh, in my neighborhood were getting cons conscripted um, into the military during the time of the Vietnam War. So without going on to too many side notes, which I can always do, uh, I want to just say this. Thank you. Thanks to the contacts, the resources, and a lot of the inside knowledge of Concern Women for America's founder, Beverly LaHaye, and also her husband, Tim, I had access to numerous authors, books, white papers that laid out plans for our nation, I would say 20 to 30 years ahead of time. And I'm going to put this back at about 25 years ago. So for someone like me who always carried a keen interest in the foundations of government, society, um, and where it was going, uh, CWA really gave me a very unique window of access that I wouldn't received elsewhere. Uh, there were certainly certain things that they were into that I didn't agree with, which is why I probably look at anybody in any organization figuring, Nobody fully agrees with everything that's going on here. Uh, one of them that hit me in particular was when CWA was so opposed to take your daughter to work day. And I remember saying to some of the women in this group, do you realize that we're always the no people? Why do we have to take a negative stance to now's take your daughter to work day? I remember being not even five years old, I don't think, when my father took me one day to work and he was a stockbroker, and I sat in a chair right beside him in his office, and I remember him making phone calls to clients. I remember um, the ticker tape, that when, when they really were old-fashioned ticker tapes, and I was just a little girl. I was thrilled to have my father take me to work, but anyway, enough about that. Um, some of the experiences that I had uh, while involved with Concerned Women for America, including or include meeting candidates who were running for president, meeting the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., speaking with authors of books that wouldn't be known about until many years in the future. And I will tell you, some of these authors are still unknown, um, but yet they will be known in years to come. Um, I remember having a private tour of our Capitol. I had lunch in the congressional dining room. I've been to the underground to see the walkways and the train system that runs beneath Washington, D.C. So those things themselves were all very interesting to me. And I share all that because I always want to be fair in all of my speaking. So as it turns out, I was reminded of being at a national leadership training event uh, held by CWA in Colorado. And when I sat in on the special session that was being held for the state communication coordinators, they brought in a former news anchor woman, and she was going to be conducting some mock media interviews. And she happened to select me out of the people that were there for the, uh, the, play, the play out of that. So she stands in front of me, I get up in front of the group, 
And this was totally unrehearsed, something I had not expected. And she posed to me the question about abortion. And when I got the microphone, my response apparently was not at all what she or the people at CWA expected. Rather than taking a hard line uh, with that microphone, my voice and words were rather compassionate and regretful for any woman who would have been terminating a life in their own womb. And uh, it clearly unnerved this anchor woman. She was visibly upset, I would say maybe angry. Uh, I apparently had done something wrong, but can I tell you, it was just what came out of me. Well, a few things formed my natural response. I hadn't, as I told you, it was unexpected, but uh, those things that had formed my response were this. Number one, when I was a student at Boston College, an undergrad, a fellow classmate one day revealed to me how sad she had been feeling. Now, this would have been my sophomore year. I think the two of us might have been the only girls on that uh, dorm floor, and she called me into her room, and maybe because I was the only one there, I have no idea. She wanted to share with me that uh, she was having a very down day. As it turned out, that particular day was the anniversary of an abortion she had had while she was in high school. And my sense was it was probably around her third anniversary. I think it was more than the second. So maybe she was 16, 17, 18, 19. So let's say this would have been maybe the third time that she had had this anniversary to her abortion. And although she was not the type of person ever to cry or to be weak, in fact, she was a very bright girl who went on to, uh, to do well, um, she was evidently under a tremendous amount of heaviness, a great deal of reject, uh, I'm sorry, r regret. And I would never think, listening to her, to condemn her, never. Her experience and her sharing it with me was that the anniversary of this abortion laid on her like a death day rather than a birthday. It was beyond unpleasant. And for her to tell me, she said, Maura, my sense is that every year, I think I could get past it. But when the day comes, it's as real as it was the day it happened. And she said, I don't even know how to describe it to you. So that was maybe my awareness of a woman who had actually gone through an abortion. And therefore, my response would be one of compassion. Uh, a second thing that I would say um, would form my my response is that uh, I was present during two abortions when I was a small child. My mother had presided over these at-home abortions for an elder cousin, and I was brought along. Um, I remember the bathtub water going from clear, you know, which looked like regular, regular bathtub water, to bloody red, and then to a murky, whitish pink as various baby parts were being identified and named, um, apparently in a need to inventory that all that had been removed from the womb was all that needed to be um, removed. Um, I don't recall having seen a face of the baby, um, you know, a head, and it's possible I could have blacked it out, but it was very clear to me that they were perfectly formed, very tiny, baby bones in that tub. And when I look back on that, um, the memory, um, I would say maybe two, not even three months, tiny, tiny, but perfectly little teensy weensy bones. And thirdly, um, I want to say another thing that would have formed my response during that uh, microphone moment is that I always imagined Jesus as someone who is forgiving, compassionate, and not condemning. So why then would I, who would always feel like I would need forgiveness from Jesus, take on a very judgmental or critical approach to others who maybe had done something that was very regretful? Um, I have to also say something further is that um, in addition to being present for those abortions when I was about four years old, I've often 
can I say surmised, that I'd been at some level coerced into doing something particularly dark uh, that I did not like as a young child. And I would not wish that on anyone. And so when I think about forgiveness, I would hope that things maybe that I did and that I covered up that were traumatizing for me that I did not want to look at because I felt that they were unforgivable, that if I would wish to be forgiven, why would I ever withhold forgiveness from any other? And the answer would be that I wouldn't. So back to CWA and crisis. Crisis, the moment of truth, the turning point, the hour of decision. There were several things that had taken place with CWA, as I had mentioned, you know, certain things I had questions about, but uh, once I had been up for a national event, we were in Washington, D.C., and they had various, um, I would say, presidential hopefuls at the time. We were not yet at the time of the uh, primary. It would probably have been maybe when primary season was, was going to start for the presidency. And they had various hopefuls there on site, very happy to get in front of this group, um, again, which represented, I want to say it was like 430 to 470,000 women, or at least that was what their roles seemed to indicate at the time. And uh, so as I'm there, I there was a lot of speculation, well, who do we think we're going to be supporting? And, and what I happened to notice is that somewhere there was a table and on the table, there was some separate letterhead. It wasn't just Concerned Women for America letterhead. It was letterhead from another organization that Tim and Beverly LaHaye, the founders of Concerned Women for America, um, had their name on. And in this case, they were actually endorsing a specific candidate. But what surprised me because I would have certainly imagined that the only candidate that they would have uh, endorsed would have been a pro-lifer. It was not, and it was very well known within um, circles that the gentlemen that they were giving their support to, and I guess that included their financial support, was a pro-choicer. Now, he wasn't so much outwardly one, but he was known as one, and he had come from a liberal background. And by the way, I'm not taking anything away from a liberal, liberal background, but the man was known in circles as being pro-choice. Now, from my point of view, I looked at that and I thought, is this really happening? Are my eyes deceiving me? And yet somehow it was being done at a table where certain eyes that wish to see could see it, and there must have been a reason for it. And my eyes definitely saw what I saw. Well, I came home from that conference, and my husband picked me up, and I got in the car, and I was without words. And I want to use the word shock. Shock? Um, I would tell you I was speechless to the point where I couldn't even talk about it. When I tried to speak, no words would come out. It was as if something got stuck in my neck and I could not form words. It was like, have you ever had somebody choke you and you wanna speak but because you're being choked you can't speak? That was the feeling and it went on that way for at least two weeks. I had girlfriends, friends who were very familiar with CWA, even involved with CWA, and I couldn't even tell them what I saw and what I knew. There was something about it that struck me as evil. I don't even know what to say. Another word came to mind was, um, it was duplicity. There was a deceitfulness there that seemed to go beyond the pale for me. And for two weeks, I, I, I don't know what I did. I probably cleaned my kitchen, cleaned the house, cleaned the dog slobber. I did everything I could to pass the time until I knew what to do. Uh, part of the time, I was thinking about writing a letter. And specifically, I wanted to write it to Tim LaHaye, Beverly's husband, because this man had even written several books. I mentioned to you the things that... I had access to. These were people 
they knew everything going on in society. They knew everything being planned for society. These were avowed Christians, far more than I would avow myself as being a Christian or profess myself as being a Christian. And I remember thinking, I, I should write this man a letter and letting, let him know what I saw and telling him everything I saw. And what I realized is that it wasn't even worth my while because the man knew exactly, exactly what he was doing because he was far too intelligent, far too knowing. Now, the other thing that I very well recall from that time period, and this is what struck me as, again, beyond the pale, and it was just sickening to me at some level, I think I'm even out of words to describe it, is that these two individuals, Mr. and Mrs. LaHaye, Tim and Beverly, did not believe that a pro-life candidate could actually run for president and win. And so what they were doing was hedging their bets by sending money to a pro-choice candidate so that they could at some level insure themselves with, this is the way I described it then, as a insuring themselves a seat at the table. And all I could think about was, both of you, you are responsible for or are leading the cause of 400 something thousand women across the United States who volunteer their time, who give up their funds to your nonprofit and who believe you are pro-lifers. And yet here you are almost in a backdoor fashion giving your, your what? Your support to someone who seems to be, seems to be a member of the enemy's camp. And I thought, what a treacherous, treacherous thing to do to all of these women. So after this two-week period of time when I realized there would be no letter I'd be writing to Tim and Beverly LaHaye to say, but you knew, um, and these are the days of the uh, fax machines. Boy, oh boy, talk about going back in time. I called Washington, D.C., and I spoke with the field director that day, and I wanted to let her know that I would be resigning. And when she was a very nice girl, when I got on the phone with her, I tried to explain to her. It didn't take me very long, but I had the same experience hit me. And I remember telling her, I said, do you see, I'm so upset about this. I can barely get the words out. This is so beyond shocking to think that this is being done behind the backs of all of these women across America. And I said to her, I said, I can't expect for you to agree with me because you work there. But she couldn't disagree with me. And I said to her that I would be resigning. And that was the reason for my call to please expect um, my letter to be coming over the facts. And uh, I want to say that a few weeks later, she also resigned from the organization. Now, the irony was when I was at this same event, something else happened that I didn't expect. And that was that Mrs. LaHaye, Beverly, had uh, announced that year's um, national winner for the, what's it called, the National Award for Media Effectiveness. And it happened to go to Maura Sweeney. And it was nothing for me to just step down from that. Nothing. The difficult thing was to come to terms with an organization that would defraud so many well-meaning members. That, to me, would typify and explain and, let's say, give the story of what the word crisis means for today's podcast, C being for crisis. That crisis, again, was not so much an external one like the Twin Towers coming down, but in a way, it was as if maybe something I had erected in my head about an organization and their belief system that really was not what it pretended to be and at some level was very duplicitous. That, for me, was a crisis. 
And there's a reason for this apparently getting shared today because we will all, if we haven't done so already, find some form of a crisis like this. It may not involve uh, abortion, it may not involve the pro-life cause, but it could involve something that we very heavily invested in. People whose lives we followed or venerated or held in very high esteem, organizations that we really looked up to. It could be anything of that sort. And then we suddenly realize it was not at all what we thought it was. And then the question becomes, what do we do when we reach that point, that let's say the boiling point or um, that place where we're forced into some kind of a decision? I told you that I would be sharing with you a dream. And I think this dream is very instructive because it's probably a picture of something that relates to almost everything. This dream happened many, many years ago, and it was of a vaudeville theater. Now, for those of you who've not familiar or are not familiar with that name, vaudeville was really popular um, during the late 1800s and let's say into the early 1900s. Um, you could see people would come and they would watch a number of uh, acts on stage and uh, the acts could be everything. It could be comedians, it could be slapstick comedy, it could be dancers, singers, it could be uh, burlesque, um, it could be orators, it could be anything. And you would see everyone sitting in their seats, they'd pay a certain amount to get in. And I want to call it a variety show because that's kind of what I think about. And I think the people that ran these vaudeville theaters knew that they would host a variety of acts and everybody would pay their money to get in to see whatever their favorite acts were. And I could remember, you know, seeing the, the big red drapes uh, on either side and you'd get the person coming out and he would introduce all the different players. Well, in this dream, which was very short, um, there were two orators that came out and this is what I was watching. The first man came out and he is definitely an orator of the first order and he is just speaking whatever it was that he was talking about to his particular group within the audience and they're loving it, they're lapping it up, they're clapping for it. He's playing right into the crowd. After he moved off the stage, Another person comes on the stage, an orator of a different sort. Now, you could think of this as being uh, an orator of a different political persuasion, but you could think in broader terms. You could think of someone who's oppositional in nature, oppositional to the guy who just got off the stage, so that in he gets on and he's speaking out of a completely different mouth. And all of his people in the audience are just, yay, they're slapping their, you know, their laps and they're, yes, you keep telling it, you say it, that's right, that's the way it is. And he's playing into his audience and he's just as effective playing into his audience as the previous orator was playing into his audience. Well, as this dream goes on, I all of a sudden find myself behind the red drapes where orator number two is coming off the stage and who's behind there but orator one and the two men glad hand each other and smile. End of dream. End of dream. Behind the curtain where the audience couldn't see, the two men were glad, glad handing but, fo but uh, they were foes before the curtain. So foes before the curtain, friends behind it. That was probably a picture of what I had seen with Beverly and Tim LaHaye. And I, you know, you would think that this wasn't this hard for me to share this particular podcast, but it was because for 25 years, I had never shared this information publicly. In fact, it pained me even to be aware of it. And 
for whatever reason, I needed to share it today. I told you that I would end this podcast with another definition that you'll probably laugh at thinking, oh, Maura, it sounds awful. The word is apocalypse. And when you normally hear the apocalypse, what do you think of? You think about the world's end. It never sounds good. The apocalypse. You could think of fires coming down on earth. You think of the worst. But oddly enough, if you look up apocalypse and its root, it actually is a Greek word. It's apocalypsis. And here's what it means. It means to uncover or reveal. It's a disclosure, a reveal. It's to remove or take off the cover. And as we approach, I would say, the the winding down of this ABCs of Now series, this one being C is for crisis, I want you to know that there will be several reveals, several disclosures, several removals of, let's say, the sheets, a taking off of the covers where hidden things will be revealed. And sometimes you may look at things that are being revealed that belong to someone else's demigod or someone else's something that they looked upon so strongly and and really held in high regard. And you may not realize that your day of an apocalypse might show up in another way. And what is difficult for one may not be the same level of difficulty for another, but we will all go through this apocalypse, this reveal, where hidden things and things that we didn't know about, things that were covered, will be seen. In fact, I'm going to say this. There's a particular Bible scripture. and I'm going to share this. I didn't expect to. But when we had the uh, this presidential election from like 25 years ago, I was still a member of CWA. I had gone to Tampa. And there was one presidential candidate who had uh, come into Tampa Bay. And I wanted to listen to him speak. And he was clearly... Uh, pro, pro-life. pro And I was at the event and somebody must have found out that I was with Concerned Women for America. And they said, would you please give the benediction? Well, I had never given a benediction before, uh, but I was only given one, what I say given, like I'm given things to share with you. Uh, it was one scripture came to mind and it was like 25 years ago. And this is what it was. There's nothing hidden that won't be revealed. Nothing concealed that won't one day be made manifest. And I'm actually reminded of that today. It was a word that I gave so long ago publicly over another microphone. And yet, here I am 25 years later telling you we're in that moment, that time period right now, the time of reveals. And the time of reveals are going to be so great and at times so incredible, we won't know what reveal to look at first. Um, I would almost caution everyone to say, be kind to your fellow friends and even those people that maybe you thought were your enemies. Be kind because we'll all be found surprised by things we didn't know. So shall I end this on a good note? (laughs) Of course I should. I told you that I would finish it off with the antonyms to um, the word crisis. And I told you that when you get to the end of your hour of decision, your moment of truth, your turning point, and you make a decision when you see things that are tensely opposed to each other, hence your moment of crisis, that you would arrive at its opposite, the antonym. And I'll give you those words again, agreement, benefit, blessing, breakthrough, calm, good fortune, good luck, happiness, miracle, peace, solution, success, wonder, advantage, boon, and certainty. Expect 
that as we're on the tail end of what I originally called the roller coaster ride, we'll end up in a place that we can call good. And we'll end up in a world whose foundations will be ready to be built upon with something brand new, clean, and something good for all. So until the next time, this has been Mora with Mora for you. Bye-bye.